Today's scripture reading is Acts 14, 21 through 23, which can be found in the Pew Bible on page 1717. They preached the good news in the city and won a large number of disciples. Then they went, then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and, with prayer and fasting, committed them to the Lord, in whom they had put their trust. Morning, everyone. Okay, what's the plan? Um, I've been thinking about organizations and people and so forth that have a plan, have a mission. And I've been trying to find out different corporations around the world, what is their mission statement. And it's interesting, Google has this as their mission statement. To organize the world's information and to make it universally accessible and useful. I think they're doing a pretty good job of that, actually. They know what they're doing. And they're doing it. Coca-Cola's mission statement is to refresh the world, to inspire moments of happiness, to create value and make a difference. Well, I know that when my grandma's old sweating freezer in her little house on 160 acres of hot cotton and wheat land in Texas, when it was really hot and I'd pull out a, a sweaty Coke out of that refrigerator... There was indeed a refreshment and a moment of happiness when we drank. So at least in part, they're making a difference in doing that. Starbucks, I found fascinating. This is their mission statement. Letter Vissi, you know what? Okay, here here it is, right here. Our mission is to inspire and nurture the human spirit. One person, one cup, and one neighborhood at a time. And it was interesting to me in digging further that their, their corporate execs are interested in creating an environment in the Starbucks along with the coffee. And that environment, that, that neighborly environment is supposed to bring people back. Ben and Jerry's mission statement. To produce the best possible ice cream in the nicest possible way. Okay. At least they know what they're doing. That's great. There were all kinds of mission statements I read. Uh, Cindy and I were watching this movie recently about Steve Jobs. I don't know if you've seen it or not. But he's the visionary founder of the Apple computer company. And uh, one of his visions was to change the world. And I think we'd have to admit that he did that. I mean, he definitely has changed the face of communication and everything uh, in the world. But another of his his mission statements that I picked up from the movie was to make the computer an extension of the person so that the person can do whatever he or she wants to do. And he's done a pretty good job of doing that while he was alive, didn't he? Interesting. It, It pays to have a plan. It pays to have a mission. Every year at this time, we get thinking again about, okay... What is going to be the vision statement for the Broadway church in the coming year? And uh, this is both invigorating and frustrating to me because it seems that some churches think that they need to reinvent the wheel every year. I know what our mission is. If you don't, there's a big problem, you know. I know what the mission of the church is. But how how do we encapsulate that? How do we say that? How do we market that? How do we put that out there? How do we communicate that in such a fashion that we as a people have a certain uh, uh, definite set of plans and a definite direction in which to go? And go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And that's pretty well it. The Bible is the divine revelation of God. And throughout history, people that have been pleasing to God have gone back to that revealed statement of God about what we're supposed to do. In the years of Hezekiah, they went back to the law and they said, this is what we as a people need to do. 
in the time of Josiah. They dug out the book of the law and they said, what has God told us to do? In the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, when they came back out of captivity and rebuilt the temple, they went back to the law and they said, what has God called us to do? And I think that's exactly what we need to do today. I looked at a bunch of churches' vision statements and mission statements and asked some of my friends that preach around the world to give me some of theirs. In Visalia, California, Cliff Sabro says that their mission statement is changing the world one soul at a time. Uh, Another preacher said their vision statement is living for the master one day at a time. Uh, I looked up several churches just around the world, one of them uh, called the City of Grace, Their mission statement is loving people to life. Uh, Westover Hills in San Antonio, making new, making great. Uh, The City Church, its mission statement is to show you who Jesus is. Uh, uh, A a big Baptist church in North Carolina, making disciples of Christ. That was the most biblical one I saw in the bunch. Uh, Church of Christ the King in Brighton, England. In Brighton, for Brighton. You could do about anything you wanted to with that. But these great corporations that had mission statements, one of the things that they had in common is they knew exactly what they were going to do and why they were going to do it. And they targeted that one mission and they went after that mission. What is the Lord's Church here at Broadway supposed to do in 2014? Well, I want you to focus on a, on a simple passage of Scripture this morning. Acts chapter 14, verse 21 to 23. And I think the church here at Broadway is supposed to do what the church has always been uh, commanded to do. Now, to set the stage for you, in Acts chapter 13 and 14, there was a mission church, the church at Antioch, that had been established by people scattered from Jerusalem. And they, in turn, became a mission church. And they sent Paul and Barnabas out into this uncharted territory which we now call Galatia. That would be Turkey in modern times. And they sent them out into the cities of Antioch of Pisidia and Lystra and Iconium and finally Derbe. And for about 14 years, if I've added up my figures right in the scriptures, Paul and Barnabas worked in this uncharted area, preaching the gospel and establishing churches and carrying out the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we come to this particular passage, they've already been preaching in Antioch of Pisidia. They've already been to the city of Lystra. They've already been to the city of Iconium. And they've come to the little town of Derbe. And they're going to establish the church. And this is what it says. They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then, see, they'd already been to these other cities. They returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. And Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. Now, see, we read that in about that long and we get the impression that it took about that long But let me remind you, this took about 14 years to do the things that are said in this particular passage of Scripture. So how about us? How about Broadway? How do we do these same simple things, maybe in new ways, using new technologies, in a changing community, in a changing world? Number one, if you're filling out your outline today, we must preach the good news in our city. Now, here we sit in the middle of a a community that reaches across the river and and out into the county and all over the place. And we sit in our building, and yes, we're preaching the Word of God in our building. But let me tell you that being building-centered, as we are in our culture, is against us in accomplishing this mission in many, many ways. Uh, We need to get out somehow and preach the gospel in this city So that in every home, up and down the streets, in every trailer park, in every apartment building, in every neighborhood, in all of Paducah and Reedland and Lone Oak and across the river and everywhere else, every person has been exposed in some way to the gospel of Christ. Look at Acts 14, 21. It simply says they preach the good news in that city. 
and won a large number of disciples. That's pretty much like go make disciples of all the nations, isn't it? Except you shrink it down to one city. And we happen, church, to be living in this city. Now, in Acts chapter 6, verse 7, listen to this statement. This is about the church that was at Jerusalem. It's very similar to what's said here in Acts 14. The word of God spread in Jerusalem. And the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased. And a large number of the priests became obedient to the faith. The word of God spread. Now, there's a lot of things we can do. But what God wants us to do is make sure that the word of God spreads. See, that's really the Great Commission in a nutshell. In Acts chapter 5, verse 28, Peter and John were arrested and they were threatened because they'd been preaching all over Jerusalem and causing quite an uproar. And in Acts 5, 28, the members of the Sanhedrin said this to Peter and John. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with this teaching. Folks, we have, we have preached the gospel in Paducah. We have taught some people and we have baptized some people. And we have kind of, we, we build it and they will come. And we've invited people and we've been a part of special efforts. But I really don't feel like that we have yet done what this verse says. I don't believe that we have yet filled Paducah with this teaching. I don't believe that we have made it so that every human being within the reach of our influence has been exposed to the Word of God yet. And I want us to take on that mission of being sure that that happens. In Jerusalem, when these people were beaten and then dismissed, Peter and John went back to their own. And it says at the end of that chapter in Acts 5.42... Every day in the temple courts, which would be like down at the mall, because temple courts wasn't in the temple. It was out in this great big wide mall where all the people were milling around. See, every day in the temple courts in public and from house to house, they did not cease to teach and to preach that Jesus is the Christ. I ask you this morning, Broadway, have we? Preach the good news completely in this city. And if, if not, how will we do it? We need to be on TV, folks. We do. We need to get that done. We need to be on television. We need to make some more efforts door to door. We need many persons to person to share the word daily. We need to fill Paducah with the gospel. That's a collective mission. All of us can do different things and uh, big and small things in that. Number two. What's the plan? We must strengthen the disciples and encourage them to remain true to the faith. Now, I look out here, you know, and I see these families that are here. Uh, I see this young lady with her babies back here. I see some of these young people that have come to us from Illinois. I see some new converts in here that have recently been baptized. I see a lot of these young people, and I think, okay... These people that have come to us and that we've taught the gospel and we've baptized these people into Christ. Now what? We've got to keep these people. And not only must we keep these people, we need to do what Jesus said in the Great Commission. Teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Remember that? In Acts 2.42, after the 3,000... We're baptized into the Christ in the, in the day of Pentecost. It says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers. Look at the verse on the screen here. This is in the same passage we read a moment ago in Acts 14. Paul and, and Barnabas, it says, Then they returned to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch. These are cities where they had already preached and already won disciples, see? They strengthened the disciples, encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. One of the things that breaks my heart as a preacher here is to look back through the years of, of baptizing people into Christ. And while it makes me rejoice to see the great progress that some have made, it, it breaks my heart to see that some we've lost. Some have gone away from the faith. Some have left God some have stopped their Christian walk. How do we strengthen people 
spiritually, as this passage says. This isn't just talking about making people feel mentally strong or, or making them feel good. This is talking about strengthening them in the Lord, strengthening their faith. How do we do that? What makes people into solid, faithful, dedicated Christians long term who will live their lives and die in the Lord? Well, we've got to teach them how to worship. And we're exploring that and we're trying to do a better job of that. And we've got to be strong in our worship. We've got to teach them the Bible in classes. There's nothing that will substitute for it. And folks, our Bible classes are really, really important. I think our life groups are undersold because I'm convinced, and I don't know about you, I think real spiritual growth happens in relationships. I mean, you look at the Bible. You had Moses and and Joshua, you know, and Joshua was mentored by Moses. And you had uh, the 70 elders of Israel, and you have Jesus and the apostles and how he mentored them, and Paul and Timothy and Titus, and you have Barnabas, who did a job of mentoring Saul of Tarsus into the person he came to be. There needs to be flesh and blood spiritual people helping other flesh and blood spiritual people uh, to mature in the Lord. So our life groups are very important. Small studies, lunch meetings with people, prayer meetings. Our seniors groups are important. Uh, Working with these new pathway kids are very, very important. But somehow... We've got to be at the business of really strengthening one another in the faith. It's not enough, church, for us just to come here and say hi and worship and leave. We have a job before us to strengthen the people of this church in the faith, to ground them, to build them, to grow them spiritually. And we need to get about different ways of doing that in the most effective possible way in the coming year. Number three today. We must train and appoint spiritual leaders for the church. Where will the Broadway church go in 2014? Where will the Broadway church go in the years to come? It will go where the leaders, the spiritual leaders, take it. That's where it will go. We will complete and work on the mission of Christ if, listen to me, if the spiritual leaders of this church are absolutely sold on carrying out the mission of Christ. That's when this church will do the mission of Christ. We will um, abide by and teach and insist on the moral teachings of Christ when and if the, the spiritual leaders of this church are dedicated to and committed to and passionate about teaching people from young people on up the moral conduct of Christ and the apostles. We will engage in and and grow in apostolic worship when and if the leaders of this church are committed to carrying on and perpetuating apostolic worship in, in this community. As go the leaders, so go the church. Remember that sermon we did a few weeks ago that called As For Me, talking about men. Do you remember that? As For Me. You know, where do you get these kind of people... Where do you get these kind of men that, that say in their heart of hearts somewhere in their life, as for me, I will serve the Lord? I mean seriously. You know, I think back to, to when I was little and what it took for my father to, to, in Salt Creek, Wyoming, every Sunday to get his kids up, no other Christians there, to get his kids up, to get us dressed to drive 23 miles through ice and snow over to Lynch, Wyoming, or up to Gillette, Wyoming, 90 miles, and to do that every single week. And when nobody was there, to have services with us and to read the Bible regularly. There was a commitment there. Somewhere in his life, he said, as for me. Nobody had to make a program for him, Wendell. Nobody had to say, "Uh, we're going to make this program, and then you... No. He was doing it because he had made up his mind, made up his heart, that no matter come what may, he was going to lead his family in trying to do the will of the Lord. Where do you get that kind of human being? Well, I'll tell you this. You don't get them by just having a class and saying, let's have a class and let's train some leaders. It doesn't work that way. Look at verse 23 in our passage. The Bible says Paul and Barnabas appointed elders. They appointed leaders for them in each church. It's vital for the local church. 
and for our future to have flesh and blood leaders. I'm not talking about just men that wear the title of elder. I'm talking about spiritual leaders. See, remember your leaders, wrote the book of Hebrews. Uh, Men who spoke to you the word of God and considering the outcome of their lives, imitate their faith. Listen to this one from 1 Thessalonians 5. Know them that are laboring among you and are over you in the Lord and are instructing you and esteem them exceedingly highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. How are we going to develop spiritual leaders across the world, across all the churches in the United States? The greatest dearth that we have today in the church is genuine spiritual leadership. Churches are hungry for it. They're crying for it. There's a lack of it. How do we get it? How do we develop spiritual leaders? We must do that here in this congregation. One of the best ways we're doing it now is through small group leadership. At least those people are having some experience in, in uh, uh, leading people spiritually and talking about spiritual things. Bible class teachers is a way we do that. But I don't think anything can substitute for mentoring and discipling. Let me give you some examples. When I was a little bitty preacher boy, Norman Gibson, who was an old preacher... He used to sit with me and talk with me about God. And I would bring my friends to him, and he would study the Bible with them, and he taught me how to to lead other people to Christ. I remember Raymond Kelsey, how he would sit down with me and talk with me about God, and and we'd talk about spiritual things. And it was flesh and blood. I, I watched the lives of spiritual people, and I was impressed by those lives, and I wanted to be a leader because of those lives. It's mentoring people that I think will help us train spiritual leaders. We need people going together to teach others the gospel. We need people praying together. We need to talk personally, spiritually, and seriously about doing the will of the Lord. And I think that's how the Holy Spirit makes leaders. One of the agendas of the Broadway Church needs to be developing true spiritual leaders for the future of this church. And then number four. We've got to trust God and do it all over again. Now, what do I mean? Go to the verse there. This is the end of Acts 14, 23. After they appointed for them elders in each one of these churches, it says, And with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. Now, see, y'all are ready to, to put your books up and go, but this is really kind of important right here. We are on our own. Think about those churches in Lystra Derby. Paul and Barnabas inspired them and preached to them and taught them what to do. And they taught them the gospel and they trained leaders and then they left them. Now what were they supposed to do? Well, they were on their own. Do you realize that the churches of Christ have no headquarters? There's no headquarters anywhere in the world that we can appeal to that's going to send people to to help us out. We are on our own. There's no government bailout coming for us, Broadway. There's no government bailout coming to whatever problems we have to solve those and help us do what we need to do. That's not going to happen. See, Christ is our Lord and we are flat on our own here. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the gospel. We have our mission from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just like us and God. Now, uh, Kenny, you know, you've got those kids that have gone off to school and college and everything. and, And once they leave... You know, like you, Ludovici, and some of the rest of y'all, once they leave and they go out there, I mean, you can't control what they do, right? They are on their own. It's them and God. They're either going to live for the Lord or they're not going to live for the Lord. We folks at the Broadway Church of Christ, we is us. We're on our own. I mean, it's us and God. And we have a responsibility under our Lord Jesus Christ to carry out his will in this community. And I don't know about you, but I take that dead seriously. Always have, always will. It would be so easy just to do church here and just carry it on and make your... I don't want to do that. I take so seriously that we are under God and we have a mission from God. And we are tools in the hand of God. 
What's our job? We need to preach the gospel in this city. We need to strengthen the souls of the disciples and encourage them to remain true to the faith. We need to, to, to develop and appoint spiritual leaders continually. And we need to trust in God and do it all over again. Now, we don't have our specifics lined out necessarily yet for the coming year. But whatever they are, they need to do those things. Let's pray together. Father, I'm so grateful for this great group of people. Lord, you know our hearts and our families. You know that we have our ups and downs. You know that we have health problems. We have spiritual problems. We have uh, victories and defeats. We know uh, that we have all kinds of, of difficulties. And yet, Father, there are so many people here that want to do your will. I pray, Father, that you will bind us together in love and encouragement one for another, that you will help us to be committed to your mission. Help us to be loving and patient with one another as we try to do what you've set us here to do. We love you, Father. We love everyone that's here, and we pray for your blessing and your strength as we try to carry out your will. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. If you're here today and you need to obey the gospel of Christ, nothing would be... Uh, greater for us to do than to help you obey the Lord. If you need to, please come as we stand together and let's sing.